Hey everyone, Rizzo here, and welcome to my hell. My long requested review of Aethys penultimate installment, Alpha Omega. I have quite a history with this one. I absolutely detested it on release, and honestly hated it even more when I gave it another chance a year later. But under a more relaxed, critical eye, is it really as bad as I thought? Well, without further delay, let's dive right into Alpha Omega. Let's start off the good with the map's main selling point. The main reason even the most cynical among us got excited for this one. For the first time in Zombies, there's eight playable characters, the Ultimus cast, and the Primus cast. Before loading into a match, the game will randomly select one Takio, Nikolai, Dempsey, and Richtofen, mixing and matching the two casts together. When I said that this got even the most cynical among us excited, I kinda lied. Because when it was revealed and classified that these two groups would be teaming up, I thought it was an awful idea. Because realistically, how the hell do you balance the over-the-top, borderline cartoonish tone of the Ultimus cast with the deathly serious existential Primus cast? Well, apparently quite effortlessly, because the tone here is a wonderfully balanced blend of the two eras. The overall tone of the experience is much lighter than the last couple premise outings, but when things get quiet, there's still some interesting dialogue between the characters that definitely screams Blundell era. It's great to see that after all these years, we finally get to hear these wildly different incarnations of our beloved characters bounce off of one another in a gameplay environment. What does Primus Dempsey have to say about Ultimus Richtofen? How do Primus Takio and Ultimus Nikolai get along? Do they get along? This is one of those cases where I'm really, really glad that I was wrong. Sometimes, you never know just how much you want something until it happens. So with the main gimmick out of the way, let's get back on track and discuss map design. A surprising rebound from the very awkwardly designed Blood of the Dead, Alpha Omega is one of the most close quarters maps we've had in a long time, and its general map design and flow is very strong. Once the initial setup is completed, all the locked power doors open and every area loops into one another seamlessly. Now, admittedly, due to how Black Ops 4 zombie respawn mechanics work, there's certain areas that should flow well on paper, but in practice, are simply way too chaotic because the zombies respawn in front of you constantly. And that's kind of the problem I have in general with this entire gameplay experience. It's good on paper, but in execution... We'll get there when we get there. Supporting the strong map design is an equally strong early game setup. With many a Treyarch endeavor, especially the Blundell ones, the map setup does a solid job of introducing the player to its main mechanics while giving them just enough bait to want to go out and explore. Unlike maps like Dead of the Night, the odds of you getting lost during your setup is super low. The map's lighting and select auditory cues give you just enough guidance so that you can easily turn on the power and gain access to the Pack-a-Punch machine. It also has these little isolated introduction sequences that perfectly introduce the player to the map's new enemies and what exactly they're capable of. But what I really love about stuff like this is that unlike Cold War, as much as I love that game, it doesn't feel like the game is holding my hand. I feel like I'm the one discovering things, even though, technically, the game is still giving me quite a bit of help. I won't fault Cold War too much for the hand-holding because A, it's admittedly quite nice to just be able to jump in a map and play quickly, and B, that game's entire point was to open the series up to a new audience that might not be super used to the lack of direct guidance. But me personally, as someone who's been playing all the way back since World at War, I'll always prefer this way of doing things. <laughs> Before moving on from the setup, let's talk about another great thing that I probably should have discussed more in previous reviews. The way the map baits the player into exploring. The way the setup is designed, as long as you're not breezing through it, and let's be honest, you're probably not going to be on your first couple runs. You'll usually find at least one piece of each buildable. Naturally, this makes you want to explore a bit and find the rest to craft some helpful gear. Or how about the Mark II in the glass container above Rushmore? The map's lighting will naturally lead you up those stairs at some point, and when that happens, most players will see that Mark II and immediately wonder, okay, how do I get that? Leading to even more exploration. As much fun as killing zombies is, this is what really made the mode special in my opinion. That feeling of mystery, exploration, and discovery. To demonstrate, let's pivot to Daran Fang for just a minute. I really enjoy this map. I like the style, the gameplay, Mommy Bellicar, all that jazz. Making good progress. 
I want mommy, I want milk, I want to be held, I want to be comforted. And if you do not do all these things immediately, I will ruin your life. But even then, I felt like something was missing. I wasn't able to put my finger on it until writing this review, but because of the incredibly compromised development of Vanguard Zombies, Daron Fong didn't launch with any main quest or even little side easter eggs. That feeling of discovering something just beneath the surface was completely absent. Basically what I'm trying to say here is, you never really appreciate something until it's gone. Anyway, what's a zombie's experience without some great wonder weapons, right? If your answer was transit, first off, that was a rhetorical question. And second off, you're absolutely right. Alpha Omega, once again, follows the time-tested Blundell method of a base weapon that can be upgraded into four unique variants. This time around, we have the Mark II and its four ammo conversion mods. The Mark II V, an unlimited ammo laser gun that fires an electric beam that stuns any zombies it touches and deals insanely high headshot damage. The Mark II X, essentially just a fully automatic Mark II, which isn't all that impressive. But when you upgrade it, it becomes dual wielded, which still isn't super impressive and the ammo runs dry in like 3 seconds, but holy shit is it fun. The Mark II Y, a variant that fires high damage explosives that can be overcharged for even more damage, and finally, the Mark II Z, a fully automatic spread shot variant capable of dealing incredibly high damage at close range. While the actual effectiveness of these variants are all over the map, they're all incredibly fun to play around with, and even better, super simple to obtain. Each upgrade process is as simple as, use the accompanying special ammo type to find the energy cell, complete one little step, and then charge it up with zombie souls. Except for that fucking chimney throw. Maybe I just suck at video games, but I can't tell you the amount of wraith fires I've wasted trying to light that thing up. Aside from the chimney, these are the kind of upgrade quests I genuinely love because A, everyone gets to try out the cool wonder weapons with little hassle, and B, I don't have to have the Call of Duty wiki open in another tab literally every time I want to get it. Looking at you, Origins. But we'll get to you. Someday. No promises. Eh, probably not. In another surprising bounce back from Blood of the Dead, Alpha Omega's main quest is not only fun, but it's actually pretty well designed and has a really enjoyable final boss fight. The entire quest is basically completing tasks around the camp for Rushmore to prove yourself American enough to be worthy of accessing the Elemental Shard. Most of the steps are simple, well communicated to the player, and feature a lot of fun little callbacks to older lore. For example, there's a step where you have to retrieve a stolen 115 canister from an on-site whistleblower. The culprit turns out to be none other than Marlton Johnson. Or later on, where you have to free Peter McCain from an Atom unit so that he can go attend some unfinished business. Business that we will literally never know about, because I'm fairly certain Craig and Blundell just forgot about this entire plot thread. And of course, there's the boss fight, the Avogadro. While not particularly difficult, the final boss fight with Pernell's Ascended form is a lot of fun and has a banger theme song. I'm not going to pretend the quest is perfect though. That escort step with the Nova Crawler that dies in one hit is absolute garbage and I will hear nothing else on the matter. But aside from that one blemish, this is a genuinely enjoyable quest in a long, long, long line of duds. Moving on from the gameplay elements, let's talk about the map's general narrative and lore. Since Alpha Omega is fan service through and through, there's a ton of callbacks to the Black Ops 1 and 2 era of zombies. Which again, fan service is not a bad thing on its own. When it becomes pandering nonsense like Peter and Gorod Krovi, where literally the only point is to get people in the audience to go, I know what that is! That's when I have a problem. Alpha Omega sees Primus and Ultimus journeying to a Broken Arrow facility in Nevada to recover the Elemental Shard. During their journey, we discover more about the mysterious Broken Arrow group that's been teased since Die Rise. We learn about their efforts to reach Agartha by reverse engineering the MPD device found at Griffin Station, how they dabbled in MK Ultra experiments, what the hell Russman's role was on the group, and just how the Avogadro came to be. Something interesting about the Avogadro is that, according to a line of dialogue he has with Ultimus Richthofen, this is what Richthofen could have become too. But for whatever reason, he intentionally never ascended to the state Purnell did. The most likely reason is one that Purnell himself posits. Fear. You were touched by the ether. Why did you not ascend like me? Were you afraid, Edward? It's just one little line of dialogue, 
but it kind of makes me view Ultimus Richtofen in a different way. He's certainly a bit of a whack job, but he's still a man underneath all that, and as Togder Toten showed, he still has some humanity in him. When Nikolai told him about the collapse of the multiverse, Richtofen paid him no mind and stayed alongside Samuel until the very end, even apologizing for having to deceive him one last time. Again, it's not much, but just one or two little details can give a character just a bit more dimension. But if we're talking characters, none are more entertaining than our newest ally, Rushmore. Voiced by John Delancey, Rushmore was an artificial intelligence designed to oversee the Broken Arrow program back in 1965. His personality is patriotic to an absurd degree. We won, because that's what Americans do. We win. Not only is he insanely entertaining, but there's a ton of little codes that you can enter into his touchpad. If the wiki is to be believed, there's a total of 40 Rushmore codes that you can enter with varying effects, from little easter eggs, to lore bits, to even the occasional cheat codes. For example, typing in 3297 will make all zombies on the map slow down to the slowest speed for the next minute. My personal favorite code, though, is 5623. Type this in, and Rushmore will tell the player a joke. President Johnson calls the Kremlin, but they tell him they can't talk because the Kremlin's on fire. So Johnson calls right back, and again they tell him the Kremlin's on fire and hang up. The third time he calls, they say, Mr. President, why do you keep calling? The Kremlin is on fire. LBJ says, I know. I just like to hear you say it. Typing in 8333 will reactivate the lounge attendant. Longtime fan favorite from all the way back in transit, Ted. Turns out Consolidated Coach didn't just design bus drivers, they also have an entertainment division. Who knew? Unlike Rushmore, Ted doesn't serve any gameplay purpose. He's purely here as a fun little bit of fan service, delivering dialogue that's just as entertaining, albeit a bit darker than his Black Ops 2 incarnation. Good news! I'm detecting a Nova 6 gas leak in the lounge, so soon we'll all be dead and my nightmarish existence will end! Jesus. You good, buddy? And last, but certainly not least, we have the map soundtrack, which isn't just a constant string of absolute bangers. But bangers that gel perfectly with the map's tone. The soundtrack is a largely upbeat set, but there's a certain eerie undertone to many of the tracks. The most obvious of which are the round transitions. What starts out nice and light like classifieds ends with a more eerie tone reminiscent of the Blundell maps. A perfect reflection of the map's tone and cast. And to wrap up the good, let's list off some nice little things that make the experience just a wee bit better. Or things that I just think are neat. After a five year hiatus, the Galvanuckles finally make a return. During the quest, if you miss the codes that the television spits out for the security measures, you can simply interact with it again to repeat them. I know this is like, basic good game design, but Zombies quests don't really do that very often. Yeah, go ahead, tell me I'm wrong. Being able to choose where to set up your fast travels is kinda cool. You can freely swap between Mark II variants at any time by simply switching between them at the frame holder in the operations building. The little sticky notes around the map detailing pre-outbreak bickering among the staff are wonderful. Okay, sticky note isn't the right term to use because, at the time of the outbreak, sticky notes didn't actually exist. The idea to take Dr. Spencer Silver's accidental discovery of a weak reusable adhesive and put it on a small note didn't come until 1974, and the Broken Arrow outbreak happened in March of 1968. They actually paid attention here, and all the notes are taped to the environment. Funnily enough, someone in Broken Arrow suggested the invention of a note with an adhesive strip on the back, to which people left him notes saying, that's a stupid idea. I just think it's neat that they got that little detail right. So, with a surprising amount of good covered, let's finally talk about why I so strongly insist, even years later, that Alpha Omega is easily the worst map in Black Ops 4 Zombies. And it all stems from one crucial little thing, the actual gameplay. There is so much wrong here that it's kind of baffling, kind of like Black Ops 4 in general. I'd say that's the last cheap shot I'll take at Black Ops 4. But would you believe me? Easily the most critical flaw of the map's gameplay is the special enemy balance and implementation. 
The map introduces two new Nova Crawler variants, the Jolting Jacks, which can attack from a long range and teleport away if they're in danger, and the Nova 6 Bombers, support enemies that exist primarily to buff their undead comrades, similar to Chaos's Ice Catalysts. On paper, I like both of these enemies. Honestly, for all the bitching I'll levy their way in about 25 seconds, they're actually kinda neat. The verticality of the Jolting Jacks is a potentially nice mix-up from the normal zombies that just walk forward at you, and I didn't really mind the Ice Catalysts on Chaos maps that weren't Voyage of Despair. So why do I hate these guys so much? Well, for starters, Jolting Jacks constantly teleport in front of you with no warning. And because an enemy's collision spawns in as soon as the teleporter effect starts in Black Ops 4 and Cold War, funnily enough, it's not super uncommon that you'll be running through a super tight corridor only to get blocked by something you literally could not react to or, hell, even attack yet because it hasn't technically spawned in. Now, the Nova 6 Bombers. <laughs> oh boy, these things are a completely busted farce of an enemy. Not only are those spawn rates significantly higher than Ice Catalysts, due to there just being less enemies in the spawn pool to pick from, but they also juice the movement speed of the enemies they buff. Oh, even better, they don't even have to be facing the direction of an enemy to buff them. They'll be facing forward, so you naturally assume they're gonna buff something behind you. Not a big deal, you can deal with it later. But then they shoot the green cumulon backwards and buff the zombie that's running in front of you. So not only do you have a zombie with roughly 2.5x health running at you, but now they're super sprinting as well. What a joyous occasion, but you may be asking. What makes me love the Super Sprinters of Cold War, but hate the Super Sprinters of Alpha Omega? In fact, they're technically worse in Cold War because they hit for 90 damage, whereas the one juiced by Nova Bombers can never hit for more than 50. A great question. In Cold War, not only is player movement significantly smoother overall, but the maps are usually much more open than this one. Alpha Omega, as discussed earlier, is an incredibly close quarters and hectic map. Now combine this with Black Ops 4's absurdly aggressive zombie respawn mechanic, and you have a recipe for utter disaster. One last thing on top of this nightmare of an enemy type is that they don't have a directional audio cue when they spawn in like Ice Catalysts. Whenever a Catalyst spawned in in Chaos, there was a lengthy and very loud animation that played where they crawled out of their little meat blankets. Funny enough, this actually worked with the aggressive spawn speeds of Black Ops 4 because if the zombies were always spawning on top of you, you'd almost never be too far away from a catalyst when it was playing this animation. So if you had your special weapon charged or you had dead wire, you had more than enough time to deal with it. Usually. Nova Bombers, on the other hand, only have a global audio cue when they spawn, meaning they could have spawned behind you, or maybe in front of you, or maybe even on a completely different floor. Who knows? All you know is that within a couple of seconds, there's half a dozen roided up super sprinters on your ass, and you're just not having a good time. Now you can say, well if you hate the Nova Bomber so much, just don't go down into the bunker if you don't want to deal with them. But I hope you never actually said that because just don't play half the map forehead is one of the stupidest fucking things you could ever say. And the final gameplay element that transforms a potentially fun map into an absolute chore is the addition of the Nova 6 gas valves. Shortly after containing the Nova 6 leak and re-enabling the facility's power, the valves around the map can get clogged up again one by one, requiring you to reopen them if you want to access the Pack-a-Punch machine. There is no way to permanently stop this from happening. Every couple of rounds, you're just required to go do busy work on top of the normal zombies gameplay, which I cannot even begin to tell you how much I hate in this mode. The night rounds and origins and all of the exo zombies objectives don't have the intended effect of, oh shit, this shakes up the gameplay, let's go. Instead, I feel a burning hot fury welling up inside of me, destroying me from the inside out and eating away everything good in my soul. But all I can ever manage to let out is a tired, The only time this kind of busy work hasn't sucked was Firebase Z, because instead of saying, hey idiot, defend the reactors while zombies just spawn in normally, the game sections off a portion of the play space and gives you time to prepare for the incoming assault. Sure, it's still busy work, I won't deny that, but it's not thoughtlessly slapped over top of the normal gameplay. It was intentionally designed to not overwhelm the player and instead divert their attention to a new objective, 
On its own, the gas valves are just kind of obnoxious, but keep in mind, every single valve is in an incredibly dangerous spot and you're actively punished for trying to play it smart. Because if you decide to leave a single crawler alive so that you can take care of the valves, interacting with one just spawns in juiced up super sprinters. It's like you're begging me to hate you. Okay, jokes aside, the Nova 6 valves are indicative of the biggest flaw of Alpha Omega. Its flaws aren't just isolated issues. If they were, I'd be much more forgiving. No map is perfect after all. The problem is that they're additive. These annoyances just constantly pile on top of each other until the match completely collapses in on itself. Alpha Omega isn't the most obnoxious zombies map ever made. No, that title still goes to the beast from beyond, and I don't think it's going to be topped anytime soon. But in terms of Treyarch's maps, this is easily one of their worst, only rivaled by maybe Die Rise and Green Run, depending on my mood. And backing up the disappointing gameplay is its equally disappointing presentation. Blood of the Dead, for all of my problems with it, and there were quite a few, had some of the best- Oh shit. <laughs> had some of the best production value I've ever seen in a Zombies map. Not only did it look nice, but the cinematic presentation of its early game and the multiple mid-match IGCs during the quest made it feel like you were playing through a movie. It was an undeniably fantastic part of an otherwise mediocre map. Now we come back to Alpha Omega, which is clearly suffering from some time and budgetary constraints. The map's lighting, visuals, and presentation range from below average to downright bad. Black Ops 4 Zombies is a game that already feels five years behind the times from a visual standpoint, but Alpha Omega in particular is just… ugly. The lighting is either super flat or washed out like Attack of the Radioactive Thing, or way too oversaturated like Classified. There's no pleasant to look at stylized middle ground like Ancient Evil or Todd or Toten, but presentation wise, nothing is more egregious than the outro cutscene, which is just laughably bad. <laughs> I think people get a bit too up in arms over the use of these in Aether's final two maps. This map's intro and Togder Toten's outro in particular actually look pretty great, for the most part. But in this case, I get the hate. It constantly uses this really ugly warping effect that makes it look like the characters are melting. The artwork itself looks unfinished, and on top of that, there's some incredibly lazy PNG cutouts taken directly from Google Image Search in place of actual artwork. This Richtofen in the background? That's just a picture from TZ Ghost's Black Ops 3 mod. Same with this Nikolai. I get it, they were probably crunched to shit when it came time to make this map, and the critical failure of their likely very expensive chaos project probably resulted in some hefty budget and team cuts. Oh right, and that whole Raven and Sledgehammer aren't getting along, so can you guys lead development on the game and rebrand it to be Black Ops Cold War thing? You can say that didn't happen all you want, but Vanguard is internally referred to as S4, which stands for Sledgehammer's fourth title. And if Advanced Warfare was S1 and World War II was S2, then... Yeah. The whole point of this little aside is to demonstrate, I get it, Treyarch clearly had a lot going against them when it came time for these last two Aether maps. But that doesn't mean I'm not gonna point out some shoddy ass work when I see it. With the bad finished, let's wrap things up with some little nitpicks that usually don't matter in these videos, but in this one, really don't matter. In the intro, you can see the edges of the Apothecon God artwork. While this problem isn't exclusive to this map, Alpha Omega's Mark IIs don't get Pack-a-Punch camos when upgraded. Another issue with the Mark II in this game is its reload sound effects. I really like the new animation set for the weapon, but they didn't get the sounds right. When you eject the power strip, it plays the sound of opening the Mark I, but when you slam a new power strip in, the sound is the Mark II. Like, why? The mesh changes made to the Nova Bombers are incredibly lazy. During gameplay, they look fine, but if you get close to the model, it looks like they just slapped a flesh helmet on top of their head, because that's exactly what they did. It looks really bad. Nova crawlers use normal zombie animations when jumping up ledges instead of proper crawler animations. This can be seen by how they momentarily stand up on their hind legs. Lightning hounds still have orange eyes underneath the blue effects. I'm just now realizing that's the first time I mentioned lightning hounds. Huh. These pebbles in the lounge are just... 
not even remotely close to being on the ground. If Samantha was safely inside the teleporter when Monty Vord Maxis, how come she's covered in blood when she arrives at the Broken Arrow facility? It's a cool visual, no doubt, but why? So, overall, Alpha Omega is the map that I hate to hate the most in Treyarch's library. It's a visually ugly, clearly under-budgeted mess that looks like it was released in 2014. And from a gameplay stance, literally every single core issue with Black Ops 4 Zombies and Jason Blundell's later maps in general is exasperated here. The absurd zombie respawn rates, the weird obsession with spamming special enemies, and the fact that the game often confuses overwhelming the player with nonsense and busy work for challenging. And it genuinely pains me to have to say this. Because as I went over for a solid 10 or 15 minutes there, there's a ton to love about this map. The character interactions are wonderful, the quest is surprisingly fun, the soundtrack kicks ass, the callbacks to old zombies lore are largely great, the wonder weapons are all unique and fun to play with, even if they do reuse the Mark II frame, and the actual map design is solid. And that's why it hurts so much. All the pieces were there to make something amazing, but because of a few fatal missteps, it just isn't fun to play. If Treyarch had adjusted some of the map's more obnoxious elements through patches, I truly believe that this would have been one of those maps I wouldn't shut up about even years later. Okay, technically I'm still not shutting up about this map years later, but I meant it in a good way. Like how I still praise the shit out of Der Eisendraka, the Final Reich, and Togder Toten. Have I ever mentioned that I love those maps by the way? Okay, but seriously, if you're able to get over the Nova Crawlers and the Gas Valves, I can totally understand why you would love this map so much. For me though, I just can't. Well, that's all for today. I hope you enjoyed, and if you would like to see more, may I suggest my season-wide coverage of Cold War Zombies, or my review of Blood of the Dead I did a while back. Links to those will be in the description if you're interested. Now, let's talk about why I made this review. I never wanted to touch this map again. But back in July, I think it was, I jokingly made a tweet where I said if Treyarch made Samantha and Grey a canonical couple in Cold War Zombies, I would review Alpha Omega. And it all started from this little piece of intel where Grey puts a smiley face and a heart on a note about Maxis. Now, obviously, I didn't actually expect this to happen because, I mean, it's an Activision Blizzard game. Come on, don't make me say it. But in the last Cold War map, Forsaken, we get this little exchange. Thank you for everything, Liz. You've been a good friend. More than a friend. Now, it can be interpreted either way, but I thought, you know what? That's close enough. And it's really sweet. And here we are. Is that stupid? Yep. But I was super adamant about keeping my word because you can't have a bit like that go on for five months only to say, I don't wanna, at the last minute. Also, one of Maxis's hoodies is hanging on a clothes rack in Dr. Gray's room in the outro. Like, come on. Good for them. Good for them. Anyway, thank you all for watching, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Take care.